presence here today is a, an amazing present to all of us. We have only been meeting every other Wednesday. I've been missing you. I hope you've been missing us. We're going to change that. Now, every Wednesday, we have a program. So next Wednesday, Fireside Chat. It won't be recorded. You can come and bring all of your cares, bring your sorrows, bring your dog, bring anything you'd like, because we are going to just have a chat for an hour and a half between all of us. So you'll be getting notices. And please come join us and just see what we're up to, because we're up to each one of you. Gosh, McFinn, I couldn't even say that better myself. Um, I'd also like to say that along with McFinn, he will be co-hosting with Dr. Murray. Uh, or actually, what's his last name? I don't know. Abramson. Oh, Abramson. yes. Abramson. I'm so sorry. <laughs> and um, so uh, McFinn brings this amazing Zen spiritual uh, spirituality to these fireside chats. But we also have um, the, the medical provider, the person that knows a little bit more about ALS, the person who's um, personally connected to ALS. And I won't say his story for you for him, but please join on Wednesdays and you can find out more about him and, and more about McFinn because, you know, we're here for you. Um, so thank you, McFinn. That was a beautiful announcement. Um, I'm going to throw it back to James because I talk too much and, you know, we want to hear from our, our expert, not from me. James, back to you. <laughs> thank you, Mirren. For those asking, if you've, this is your first time, I'm going to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Michael Weiss. Uh, and while he gives his presentation later on, feel free to ask questions in the chat and we will ask them during the Q&A. But I'm going to give a little bit of a biography. I'm going to apologize in advance for mispronouncing some of these names because, Dr. Weiss, you are involved in a lot of things, <laughs> which is great. Right. <laughs> but Dr. Michael Weiss is the founding director of the Division of Neuromuscular Diseases and professor of neurology at the University of Washington Medical Center. He completed neurology residency training at Georgetown University and fellowship training in neuromuscular disorders at the University of Maryland and in neurochemistry and neuroimmunology at the National Institutes of Health. He is the co-director of the UW Muscular Dystrophy Association Clinic, co-director of the, and here's where my French should come in, Charcot-Marie Tooth Disease Center of Excellence and co-director of the Guillain-Barre Syndrome Chronic Inflammatory Demyelinating Polyneuropathy Center of Excellence. He is also co-director of the MDA Certified Amyotrophic Lateral Sclerosis Center of Excellence. In addition to that, he is a fellow of the American Academy of Neurology and the American Neurological Association. He has been on the editorial board of Muscle and Nerve and is an ad hoc reviewer for the uh, Annals of Neurology and Journal of Clinical Neuromuscular Disorders. He has authored or co-authored over 100 journal articles, reviews, and book chapters primarily focused on neuromuscular diseases. He sees patients at the University of Washington Montlake campus. His clinical interests include the diagnosis and treatment of neuromuscular diseases, including ALS. Uh, in addition to treatment trials of ALS, his current research interests include biomarker studies in ALS, which we are very much on board for, and treatment trials for inflammatory myopathies, CMT, and this last word, myasthenia gravis. Let me know if I butchered that one as badly as I think I did. Uh, without no, further did ado, well. though, thank <laughs> you very much. Dr. Weiss, welcome. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, James, and, and everyone else from Everything ALS. And James, your French accent was dead on. You, I, I really tried so hard. <laughs> yes, you did a great job. So how do I, do I just share my, just go to share screen and that should yes, do it? Yes, please. Okay. And put it in presentation mode and be nice and big for all of us. Okay. Let's see. Um. That's not it. Is that is that working? Yes. Yes. If All right. Can, great. Let's get it in the um, in the the full screen. That would be perfect. Oh, I should. I have to put it somehow. Put it in the full screen. I believe under display settings it should be. Mm. Right at the very top there. Oh yeah. Okay. 
Let's see if it gives you a. It, it just says swap presenter view and slideshow and duplicate slide, slideshow under display settings. Try this. It should show. If anybody's a little bit more apt with PowerPoint than I, feel free to jump in in that chat there. Um, um, no, that's not going to do it. Yeah, I don't. This is usually what I see when I project to like a PowerPoint, like a with using a PowerPoint projector, but I don't usually see this. Maybe there's a different mode here. Hey, um, hey mode. wife, could you try the three action buttons um, right there on the bottom of the screen? Uh, oh. Just to the right of that. Oh, yeah. yeah okay. Uh, screen. Could you do hide presenter view? Maybe that would work. Oh, that just puts it right back here. Okay, so then from here, let's go to slideshow up at the top, or even at the bottom, if you go to that projector. Yeah. This no. one? Yep. That should be a yes. It's not doing anything. <laughs> oh, resumes. Okay, slideshow, and then, yeah. Um, so the slideshow is up at the top left now, and then there's a drop arrow. Uh, just this yeah. Um, okay, that's not something. But then you could just resume slideshow. This is actually something that we commonly see, and I just wish I knew <laughs> the exact steps. So resume slideshow, that's and then that. Oh, that should be right up there where it was, right where you were, top oh. left. Up so here. The top left, the little play button you had, I realize I'm pointing on my screen and you can't see it. Um, go up to the right where it says that little play button. It looks like a projector's coming down right to the this right one. there. This one? Yes. Hit start from beginning. Let's see if that'll give us anything. Huh. And the bottom projector slide is not doing anything either. Not, not now. And what about to the left of that? What does that one say? Um, maybe I should go. It's not, none of the buttons are responsive at this point. I wonder if I should just, just click close out it and and try in. again. Yeah, let's do that. This is how you know it's a live show, folks. <laughs> <laughs> then try down here, maybe slideshow. Yep. Slideshow. This kind of goes back to that setting. Display settings right at the top. Do you see that? Um, the top middle. Yep. I would swap. click the swap presenter view. view. Yeah. Try that. This one? Yep. Yes. There Perfect. we go. Okay. All right. So I knew we could do it. Team effort. Um, all right. So I, I alter the title of my talk ever so slightly. So I'm going to talk about mixiltine as a treatment for muscle cramps, but I want to speak a little bit about hyperexcitability or overexcitation of motor neurons in ALS, just because that's what led to the discovery that mixiltine is a useful medication for muscle cramps. And, and James, you may, went over my, my personal back history quite well, and I just want to reiterate that ALS is near and dear to my, my heart, not because I want anybody, of course, to have this disease, but because I just feel like I can contribute in some way to helping patients with ALS. I, do my, I try to do my part, and we follow at least um, on any, um, in excess, I'd say, of 150 ALS patients at any given time in our clinic, and it's a team effort. There are many of us who see patients, not just me. And our group participates in several ALS clinical trials, and most recently, uh, the Radicava and Relivrio st studies that led to FDA approval of those drugs. But we also participate in investigator-initiated studies, and a recent one that I'm going to speak to is mixilatine. And so just by way of background, ALS is a disease that causes degeneration of upper and lower motor neurons. And where do those nerve cells arise? Well, upper motor neurons arise in the motor cortex in the brain. They send processes down until the lowest part of the brainstem, which is the bulbar region of the brainstem, or they send processes down to the spinal cord, the upper motor neurons. And when they, are, they start to de degenerate, to die, patients experience weakness and coordination and stiffness, which on clinical examination by a neurologist would manifest as spasticity or increased muscle tone, 
they'll have increased reflexes or hyperreflexia. And then they can also have, as, due to involvement of the tracks that go to the brain stem, if they're in involvement of both sides of the brain, something called pseudobulbar, pseudo, pseudobulbar affect, which is increased emotionality that's fairly common in ALS. But there, in addition to the upper motor neuron signs, they, they should have lower motor neuron signs or evidence for damage to lower motor neurons. That's those two things together is, is what we typically see in ALS. And those are nerve cells or motor neurons that arise either in the lower part of the brain stem, the bulbar region of the brain stem that send nerve processes to the muscles of the, the uh, lower the lower part of the face and the swallowing muscles that, and the tongue. And that's what leads to trouble with speaking or swallowing. Um, but then it, there are also motor neurons that arise in the spinal cord, which are sometimes called anterior horn cells. And when those are damaged, the limb muscles become affected or the diaphragm, the muscles of breathing become affected. And so patients then just develop symptoms uh, that are specific to lower motor neurons degeneration, which include muscle cramps. Of course, we're going to talk a, a bit more about that in a moment. Muscle twitching or fasciculations, which are uh, very commonly seen with cramps. Muscle weakness, of course, and then wasting of muscle, which and we use the term atrophy, and their reflexes become reduced or hyporeflexic, and they their muscle tone becomes diminished or hypotonic. ALS is not uh, a, it's not a um, a common disease, but it's not rare either. In North America, there are uh, two to 100,000 new cases per year. That's the incidence. And at any given time, somewhere between two to seven per 100,000 a year, that's the prevalence. The median age is 55, but it, I've seen patients as young as 20 and as old as 80. So there's a, quite a breadth of, in terms of when it can begin. There is a slight male predominance, men greater than women of three to two uh, on, in terms of the ratio. We know this is a terrible disease that unfortunately is at this point a terminal disease and the average life expectancy is of course not good. It's typically three years with 90% dying within five years. Uh, bulbar onset patients, unfortunately, they have a, a faster rate of decline, but there are always patients who live um, sort of beyond expectation. So there is a lot of heterogeneity in terms of life expectancy. But bulbar onset patients typically only live about a year. For years, all the only disease modifying treatment that we had to give patients, offer patients, was Riluzol. And Riluzol um, was approved by the FDA in, I believe, the late 1980s or mid 80s. And there have been multitude of studies that have shown that it improves survival. And these are called Kaplan-Meier survival curves. So um, the red here is based on three studies. And, and this is the, the, the drug, patients given the drug, and then the blue given placebo. And you can see that their survival improves. There's a slowing of the of uh, uh, the rate of mortality in the patients who are treated with the drug compared to placebo, but it's only about two to three months. So it's not, not what we had hoped for, for sure. Uh, I should also mention what, how Riazole acts is it blocks glutamate, which is a chemical in our brains that when, when it accumulates in excess, which it does in ALS, it causes damage to motor neurons. So it's preventing that from happening, but clearly that is not the key to the mystery of what, what leads to ALS in most patients. It has an impact, but not as much as we'd like. So more recently, there has been a approval of a drug called Derivone. The other brand name for it is Radicava. And that drug was first approved as an IV formula. And then the oral formula was just approved very recently, I want to say eight months ago. And it was predicated on a trial where patients were either given the drug or placebo, and they were followed for 24 weeks. And it looked at a measure of their functionality called the revised ALS functional rating scale score, which is often done in the clinic, or we do it in the clinic just routinely. And you can see again, uh, the patients who are treated with the drug, which is which is shown here in red with a Deravone, there's this, they have a slower decline in the ALS functional rating scale score give, um, after a number of months of the study compared to placebo. And they drop only about, they only dropped about five points over the course of the six months of the trial compared to placebo, 
with, and they dropped, those patients dropped seven and a half points. So there's a two and a half point difference, which on this scale is me it's a meaningful difference. It didn't arrest the disease. We weren't expecting that to happen, um, but it, it, it led to FDA approval of the drug. More recently, there has been another drug called uh, Relivrio that was just approved by on, and put on the market maybe about, uh, I wanna say five months ago, can't remember exactly when, but recently. And the, the FDA approved the drug based on another randomized controlled trial called the Centaur trial. And, and for the Centaur trial, that drug was, used, the, the name for it was AMX0035. And this is a trial in which 137 patients got the drug, which is the, the two components of the drug, sodium phenylbutyrate and terursidile or Tudka. And they had to and it's a powder that dissolves into liquid and they take it twice a day and they were compared to patients who are just getting placebo. And the primary endpoint of the study was again, change in the revised ALS, uh, ALS functional rating cells so were over the same length of time as Adirivone, 24 weeks. Uh, other outcome measures that were secondary, the cha change in strength and then breathing parameter called the force body capacity, which is often done in the clinic um, or typically done in clinic, in, at least in our clinic, um, when patients come in for their visits. So this is a very this is very similar to what I showed you for Adirivone. This is looking at the ALS functional rating scale score on on the y-axis, the x-axis, the weeks over time, and this is again a 24-week study compared is similar to the Adirivone study. And interestingly enough, the results are almost identical to the Adirivone study. Patients decline over the course of the study. Um, uh, the patients on the drug at a slower rate compared to placebo. Um, about 0.4 points per month over the course of 24 weeks. That's about two and a half points. So it was almost, it was interestingly almost identical to the Adirivone findings. It slows the rate of progression. I can, I'm use baseball analogies and I consider these to be solid base hits. I don't want to consider them to be more, but they do something. They definitely slow the disease down. There is also some compelling evidence that has not been corroborated, and the FDA did not sign off on this, that uh, Relivrio can potentially improve survival in ALS. And so this is based on open label extension data. So all the patients are in the study were offered an opportunity to stay on the drug, to go into open label extension. And mo many of them did, it was majority. So after the six months of the study, the, the patients on placebo and the patients who previously got the drug all got the drug. And what's interesting is that, again, these are survival curves. They're called Kaplan-Meier survival curves. You can see there's a separation, a slowing of the, the rate of, of uh, mortality in the patients who are on the drug from the get-go. That is right at the very beginning of the randomized trial compared to the patients who got started on placebo or, or initially then were they were offered or given the drug subsequently after six months. And the difference was six and a half months. So that's given that it wasn't a true randomized control trial. There's sort of a combination of open label data and randomized data. I think that's very promising. And, and so basically what this means is the patients who got the drug initially, they who had a head start on the drug, they actually did better. They survived longer even only had it, having had it just for the six months, it's just six months earlier than the placebo treated patients. Now this has to be corroborated in a bigger trial, which is ongoing called the Phoenix trial. And that's completed in the United States, the, the United States participation, but it's ongoing in, um, I wanna say Europe, Australia, and Japan, and, and probably Canada, but I, I'm not entirely sure. I know for Europe and Australia for sure, and Japan for sure, I'm not sure about Canada. So what does this tell us? Well, they're, they're, it's sort of, it's promising. These are, these are new drugs that do something. And after having had no drugs available to patients for 40 years that modify the disease, now we have two new ones. None of them are arresting the disease. None of them are, uh, let alone reversing it. So we've got to do better. And part of the reason why it's been challenging to do better is our understanding of the disease is incomplete. So uh, here are some of the very common ideas about the cause of ALS, but, but we don't really know if these apply to all patients, when, whether these are 
the, the early, early events in the disease or later events, but we target them, we try to target them anyway. So genetic causes, in about 10% of patients with ALS, there is, uh, they have a family history um, and in association with, often with a known genetic mutation, most commonly c 9 orf 72 SOD1 is another mutation that's fairly common and is the earliest one identified. Uh, then there's also the idea of accumulation of the byproduct of energy metabolism, which are called oxygen-free radicals. Uh, we talked about Ruizol, which targets this chemical that's important for nerve, process, uh, nerve signaling called glutamate, but is, there's too much of it in the brains of patients with ALS. And then we the accelerated apoptosis, which is a programmed cell death, that all our cells are programmed to die, but at motor neurons and ALS, there's evidence they do that in accelerated fashion. And probably Relivrio targets this to some extent, not entirely sure. And then there's autophagy, impairment of something called autophagy. Autophagy is basically the waste bat, the uh, garbage disposal of our cells. So our, our cells um, we create proteins that we don't need, debris, uh, and then we have to get rid of them. And autophagy is the way by which we get rid of them. And it's, we know that it's impaired in ALS neurons, motor neurons. So medicines that can promote autophagy have potential to help in ALS. Um, proteins in ALS uh, deposit in, in places they don't belong. They aggregate due to misfolding. So targeting that is probably would be worth trying. There's some evidence for inflammation in the brain of ALS patients that's, that this is being looked at in, by, um, in a number of studies or has been. But I'm going to focus on something called neuronal hyperexcitability, a motor neuronal hyperexcitability, overexcitation of motor neurons, and how that led to use of mixilatine and the discovery that it's useful for muscle cramps. Uh, I'm going to talk about in a moment. Now, this is a complicated slide, but I'm going to go through it hopefully in a way that's, that you can, you, that you can uh, learn something about hyperexcitability. So there is a mouse model for ALS, which are um, pre, they're basically uh, um, a mouse model that, you, that incorporates the human SOD1 uh, mutation, and most particularly the G93A mutation, and it recapitulates human disease to some extent, not as well as we would like, but it's our best animal model. So groups have looked at motor neurons that they took, that they extracted from sacrificed mice. And then they did what's called micro patch clamping, where they assess the electrical properties of these motor neurons in cell culture. And they looked at, uh, they've looked at embryonic mice way before they develop any signs of the disease. And so this lower panel here is looking at a number of cells using this technique to measure something called persistent sodium current. And these are from the animals that have this mutated SOD1. And then this is looking at patients who are, uh, are just normal cont uh, control mice, I should say, that are age matched. And you can see there's this shift to the left. Uh, there are many more cells that have increased sodium current. And this is reflective of, we think of hyperexcitability or corresponds to hyperexcitability. And then, you, when you, in another group of uh, similar experiments, using a technique where you can uh, add current to the cell culture model to get neurons to fire, to discharge, and again, looking at H-match controls from mutant motor neurons compared to the controls, there's a repetitive, there's a, there's a firing frequency that's increased in, uh, with every level of current. So this is the same current, this is the same current, and the and controls and motor and the mutant motor neurons, um, and it's always fat. It's always faster in the mutant motor neurons, and that is consistent with repet with hyperexcitability. They're more easily discharged. The responses that they're seeing, the threshold for discharging is lower, and that's shown here in this graph. That at every level of current in the mutant motor neurons, these triangles compared to the squares, which are the controls, there's the increased firing frequency that suggestive of this as an early event in motor neurons in this mouse model for ALS. So how can we measure excitability in humans? Well, there is a device that can do that. It's called transcranial magnetic stimulation. It's a very powerful magnet that basically gets the motor neurons excited 
And then they send their they send impulses down the nerves, which cross over into the other side of the body, as nerves do typically do. And then one can record over the muscle to generate a response, which is called a motor evoke potential. And so th there, is a, there are groups not in Australia and elsewhere that have looked at whether there's evidence hyperexcitability in patients with ALS. And they've looked at, in this, this particular study, which is an early study, they looked at patients with familial SOD1 ALS and then sporadic ALS. And then these are controls, either carriers of the SOD1 mutation, which are the, the circles or the controls or the squares. And then it, you can see that as they increase the level of stimulation, there's no difference. And all of a sudden, there's a steep increase uh, in the amplitude of the response, its motor evoke potential. It separates from the controls. And, and that, is a low, that means they have a lower, motor thre lower threshold for generating a response. And then the maximum response is substantially greater than in the controls. And all of this is consistent with hyperexcitability of cortical motor neurons. Uh, one more fairly complicated slide, and then I think we're on to some that are a little less complicated. So there is a technique for also assessing excitation of motor nerve axons. And motor nerve axons, we can do standard testing by nerve conduction, which patients in the audience undoubtedly have had, where the patients get a pulse that's replicating the normal electrical current going down the nerves, and then it's recorded over a muscle to generate a response similar to what I showed you for transcranial magnetic stimulation, which is called a compound muscle action potential. But these are individual pulses normally, the single pulses, but one can combine this equipment with a, a stimulator that continues to deliver pulses of different duration and intensity to generate uh, information about excitability properties of the motor nerve axon, which indirectly reflects the motor neuron. And what's interesting is there are parameters that we can assess that differ based on whether patients uh, have a higher number or a lower number in regard to survival even. And so there's a, a measure of uh, that we call the strength duration time constant, which is related to the, the correlation between the strength the the intent of the stimulus and the duration. And if you take the, and then this, this is a study of about 70 patients, and they split the patients in half, and they looked at the patients the higher number, and they looked at the patients the lower number, and they found that these are survival curves. There's a big separation. Patients with a lower strength duration con time constant survive longer, 51 months versus higher, 34 months. And the higher means more excitation, hyper -excit increased hyperexcitability, reflective in particular pers increased persistent sodium current and other parameters that do very much the same thing um, show very much the same impact threshold change at 0.2 millisecond duration again a big separation lower versus higher uh, 52 months versus 29 months of survival and super normality 41 months versus 21 months and all of this is consistent with the idea that there is hyperexcitability going on to spinal motor neurons and motor nerves. And that can, and the higher the, the hyperexcitability, the, uh, the more detrimental to the function of motor, these spinal motor neurons. All right, so now on to uh, muscle cramps. So and I'm gonna explain why what I talked about is relevant to muscle cramps in a moment. So muscle cramps occur in over 90% of all patients with ALS. And muscle twitching, we see that in a very similar number of patients, that there's sort of two sides of the same coin. And we think they have to do with hyperexcitability of lower motor neurons and motor nerve axons due to motor neurons dying and other motor nerves taking their place. And when they do that, they, they send out these little branches, these little twigs that, stim, that then and find their way to the muscle. And these twigs, which are called collateral sprouts, are immature. They are hyperexcitable as a consequence of having increased persistent sodium current or, or changes in other ions like potassium ions. They, muscle cramps in ALS are, can be very frequent and debilitating, but for years, the treatment for them was very unclear. So uh, for we just used empiric treatments like Valium or other medicines in the benzodiazepine family. We use baclofen.
I'll, there's somebody just sent me a question earlier and I'll answer that at the very end about quinine sulfate, which I think can work, but has a lot of potential toxicity issues. So, uh, and it's not really been clearly shown to work in any trial. In fact, there have been a number of treatment trials looking at effects of different medicines, including Riazole, to see if they impact on muscle cramps and none of them do, or none of them did. Muscle cramps, based on a very nice natural history study that was done by Jim Karras about seven years ago. I think he's at um, Bowman Gray, whatever the medical school is in, I wanna say South Carolina, North Carolina, South Carolina. So he did a survey at his group, did a survey of early stage ALS patients by phone uh, over 21 months. They looked at, or they enrolled 41 patients. The average age was 64 years. Patients varied in where they developed the disease first. They either had it in the cervical region, which is the arms, and about a third, almost 50% had it in the legs or the lumbosacral region, and 20% in the bulbar muscles, the muscles of speech and swallowing. 78% had cramps with an average frequency of 47 per month. A large number of them had quite severe cramps. Almost the same exact number had fasciculations or muscle twitches. Oh, about 40% reported frequent cramps, which they defined as at least two cramps a day. And they found that about 50% of patients reported that it interrupted their sleep. Younger patients, that is patients 60 years or younger, had fewer cramps compared to older patients, fewer cramps per month. And that was quite different, 16 uh, cramps per month versus 45. That's a big difference. And then limb onset patients also had a big difference compared to bulbar onset patients. They had uh, 37 and a half cramps per month versus seven, about seven cramps per month. But there was no difference in comparing gender. So men and women suffer cramps equally with this disease. And they looked at patients over a course of up to three years. And of course, some of those patients died and some dropped out. And then they found that there was a, a mild diminution of the number of muscle cramps that per, per um, uh, month that patients suffered that it didn't drop all that much and not significantly, suggesting the muscle cramps persist throughout the course of the disease, unfortunately, and they can be quite debilitating. So obviously finding a more uh, reasonable treatment may, may, uh, would be, be fantastic because a lot of patients su suffer from muscle cramps with this disease and needlessly. So, so why mixilatine? Well, mixilatine is an older drug that is FDA approved as a so-called class 1b antiarrhythmic cardiac antiarrhythmic agent it's used to treat abnormal heart rhythms um, the cardiologists don't think it works very well but it's usually pretty well tolerated so they they would use it otherwise but the other property of mixilatine is it's a use dependent sodium channel blocker that reduces sodium current persistent sodium current which as i talked about earlier has implications for motor neuron um, dysfunction because it, it, it correlates with hyperexcitability or it could have implications. So it's also an anesthetic. It's in the lidocaine family. So it's been used for a number of years to treat neuropathic pain. There's not a great medicine for that. So the other reason is mixilatine has been shown in the same mouse model I mentioned earlier to improve survival. And again, these are survival curves. Uh, this is studies out of Bob Brown's laboratory. He was at Massachusetts General Hospital, now at the University of Massachusetts, where he's the chair. He's a very prominent neuroscientist and ALS, uh, ALS neuroscientist and neurogeneticist and neurologist. And so what he did was he gave patients mixilatine, thinking that it might have an impact on the disease because it has implications for suppressing hyperexcitability. And he injected it uh, into the abdomen at age 60, way before they develop the disease. They usually develop disease maybe day 100 or so. And then he found that compared to the saline, there was a, a significant difference. It wasn't profound. It didn't arrest the disease. It was about five days within the life of a mouth, uh, mouse. I'm not sure what that extrapolates to a human, but it was significant. And then the time during which the mice showed signs of, of motor neuron disease, that, that also increased in the patients with mixilatine compared to the control, the age match controls of about seven and a half days. And that again was significant. And then there, one other notable piece of information about mixilatine is that it had already been shown in one study to slow, to reduce muscle cramps in, not in ALS, 
But in another disease in which motor neuron degeneration does occur to some extent, and that is a disease called Macheta Joseph's disease or spinal cerebellar ataxia type three. And so this is looking at the number of cramps per month. And these are patients with Macheta Joseph's disease. And these are ALS patients. And these, um, so maybe Macheta Joseph's maybe even higher frequency per month compared to ALS, are so both fairly significant. And these are other diseases in which motor neurons or nerves are involved that can cause cramps. This is spinal muscular atrophy and peripheral neuropathy. So they decided just to treat eight patients with mixiltine. And they gave them 150 milligrams twice a day of the drug uh, over three months. And the patients knew what they were getting and the examiner knew what they were getting, but nonetheless, they had a very significant decline in their cramp frequency, almost every patient did. So it seemed like a promising drug for muscle cramps in this disease, but it had not been tested in ALS. So the reason why I did the study that I oversaw is because of what I just mentioned as background. There's evidence of persistent sodium current and hyperexcitability of motor neurons, both spinal and cortical motor neurons in an ALS mouse model or best ALS mouse model, best ALS model period in vitro and cell culture. I, there's evidence in humans that by transcranial magnetic stimulation and threshold tracking nerve conduction that there's uh, cortical and peripheral nerve hyperexcitability in ALS patients, and it might stratify risk in terms of survival for threshold tracking nerve conduction findings. There's improved survival in the SOD1 G93A mice, as I mentioned just a moment ago, out of Bob, the work out of Bob Brown's lab. And then the thought was that it could improve muscle cramps that result, we think, from peripheral nerve hyperexcitability. So I did a study that was not a big study because it, it uh, mostly because of funding, but also it was an early stage study. It was a phase two trial with the primary outcome measure determine the safety and tolerability of different doses of mixility in ALS patients. And um, the reason why we did a safety and tolerability study is because it really not had not been tested in, in that patient population. We couldn't assume that it would have the same safety and tolerability as it does for cardiac patients. But we also wanted to make sure that the drug got into the central nervous system. So we wanted to look at spinal fluid. And we also want to look at serum concentrations to see how long it, when it peaked and how long it lasted. And then we looked at some other exploratory outcome measures, changes in the vital capacity, the slow vital capacity, the measure of breathing, the revised ALS, ALS functional rating seal score, changes in muscle cramp frequency and intensity as measured by a visual analog scale, um, which I'll show you in a moment. So the ALS uh, FRSR questionnaire looks at 12 questions that are graded from zero to four. It's done in the clinic. It assesses patients' capabilities for doing certain functional activities regarding their speech and swallowing, their motors, their fine motor skills, their large motor skills, and their breathing capacity. We do this every clinic visit because it gives us a lot of information about how patients are doing. This is the visual analog scale, which seems very simple, but this is actually what's done in, in, uh, for, most, for many studies using that assess pain. And it's really easy. This is a very happy patient who has no pain. So that's a zero. This is a very unhappy patient who has the worst possible pain they could have, you know, excruciating pain, and this is a 10, and there are different degrees of in between. So we did a study where we, we initially screened 90 patients, and then we randomized 60 to either 20 to either placebo, 20 to either 300 milligrams a day mixilatine, or another 20 to 900 milligrams a day of mixilatine. And we did this in divided doses. Patients had to come back at week one, two, six, and 10. They had to get every study, uh, revised ALS, ALS functional rating scale score, slow vital capacity, safety labs, electrocardiogram, because there was some concern about the potential, some potential for prorhythmic effect of mixilatine that it could cause arrhythmias. We would collect a, a cramp diary that patients would do at home and, and recording the number of cramps they'd have on any given day and their intensity. And then we did a pharmacokinetic study, as mentioned, looking at serum and cerebral spinal fluid of spinal tap at week six. Then they had their last visit at week 12. Um, and they were, got a phone call at week 16 just to see how they were doing once they were taken off the study medication. So these are the baseline characteristics and the average age is 58. There's slightly more men in the study than women, 61% months per diagnosis, about eight ALS functional rating skills were 35 out of 48. Body capacity, 
about 86%, which is actually still pretty good. Number of cramps in the previous 24 hours, 1.9, and then previous 30 days, almost 43. The maximum intensity of the cramps in the previous 24 hours at baseline 2.2, cramp pain uh, over the previous 30 days in intensity, 3.2. And then if we, we looked at patients who had at least, or we subdivided into patients who had at least 10 cramps within the previous 30 days, and that was about 60%. And for each of the treatment arms, these baseline characteristics were fairly evenly balanced. So there was no inequity in terms of starting groups, in terms of their parameters. This is the concentration over time. The drug peaks at about hour, hour two, and it's sustained for quite some time. We think the half-life is probably about 12 hours based on other studies, but it definitely peaks at hour two, works pretty quickly. Uh, the, the dotted line is the higher concentration, the solid line is the lower concentration. And then it correlates the, with the, the CSF correlates with the serum. This is CSF and this is plasma from the serum, correlates very nicely. And about 40% of the, or 0.4, the, the, this is the ratio of CSF to plasma for about 40% of the drug gets into the central nervous system at low dose, of about 45% at high dose. So that's what we wanted to know. Does it get into the central nervous system where it has to target motor neurons or otherwise it's, it's gonna be useless drug? So these are the side effects. So the gray is the higher dose, the blue is uh, placebo, the black is lower dose. And there were some side effects that were evident at the higher dose. In particular, higher dose patients had a little bit more emotional ability they had increased dizziness um, and constipation, but those didn't reach statistical significance. Uh, they, uh, the, there was no difference between the 300 milligram dosing and placebo, but in 900 milligrams, there was a statistically significant difference in regard to tremor and in particular nausea. About four, over 40% of patients developed substantial nausea and about a third of patients of that dose had, did have to drop out because of it. Unfortunately, there was no significant effect on the ALS functional rating scale score, which is shown in the top panel and the slow vital capacity. And the blue is the placebo, the black diamond or black triangle is 300 milligrams. The red square is 900 milligrams, but it wasn't a very long. And then this is slow vital capacity and it also didn't show any significant benefit, but it wasn't a very long study and we weren't, or a big study, we weren't necessarily anticipating that we'd see and efficacy in regard to disease slowing. And it doesn't mean that it can't slow the disease down. It just, the study doesn't suggest clearly that it will. But what it did do was it very substantially reduced cramp intensity and frequency. So this is cramp frequency per week. This is cramp intensity. And the blue again is the placebo. The, red, the black triangle is the 300 milligram dose. The red square is the 900 milligram dose. And you can see that, especially with the red, the, the uh, higher dose, there's an immediate effect within two weeks. It's a profound decline um, in both the frequency per week and the cramp intensity. And so overall, uh, we take all, all the patients in the study, there was a 69% reduction in muscle cramps at low dose versus placebo and 84% at high dose and cramp intensity, 55% reduction by the, and this is by week 12, um, at low dose and 75% at high dose and all significant except for the, the lower dose or cramp intensity, which didn't quite reach significance, but came close. And then when we looked at patients with at least 10 cramps in the last uh, 30 days, it was even more of a dramatic decline. 78% decline at 300 milligrams, 93% decline versus placebo at 900 milligrams. And then for frequency and then intensity 63% um, at low dose and 84% versus placebo at high dose. Very, very powerfully impactful drug. So the final results that I didn't talk about is that it was safe. We didn't have any laboratory changes. There were no EKG changes, none whatsoever. Unfortunately, at the high dose, some patients had to drop out about a third due to nausea and in or tremor and in particular nausea. There was a peak plasma concentration that occurred at week two or at hour two. So it works pretty quickly. It, get, it got into the spinal fluid pretty well. Not, um, so it gets into the central nervous system pretty well, which is what we had hoped for. And it correlates well with the concentration in the serum.
Unfortunately, there were no changes in the, in the disease uh, progression markers, the revised ALS functional rating scale sort of slow body capacity, but it was likely underpowered and too short to determine its efficacy. Uh, so we really just don't know that whether it can slow disease progression. I, I, I just say we just can't tell from the study. It might, but it may not. But what it did do, it much to maybe a little bit to our surprise, it robustly reduced muscle cramp frequency and pain, and it did it in a dose-dependent manner. So higher the dose, it did more. Of course, it increases side effects to the higher dose too. So there was dose-dependent side effect, increased side effect profile too. So the remaining few minutes, I'm gonna talk about another study that corroborated the results of, my, of the study I oversaw, which I, for which I was peripherally involved. So this is out of the Mayo Clinic, uh, or actually if you see Davis, uh, Bjorn Oscarson is now at the Mayo Clinic in Jacksonville, did a much star, smaller study targeting muscle cramps alone in ALS. And so he looked at just one dose, 150 milligrams twice a day <laughs> versus placebo. And he, he studied 20 subjects and he, what he did was half the subjects got the drug, half placebo for two weeks. Then they were taken off the medication for a week to wash out the drug. And then they were switched over to the other treatment arm for another two weeks. And at the end of the whole study uh, or at the end of every two week period, there was an analysis period. So they also enriched for patients with higher numbers of muscle cramps. They had to have at least two cramps per week to, to enroll into the study. So their, their baseline characteristics are somewhat similar to the study that I just talked about. Uh, a little bit older, 60, about 62 years of age on the average. Slight, again, slight male predominance, 65%. Uh, 65% of patients are also on really result, which they often are for any trials. And that was about true. That was also true for mixolatine, uh, the first study I mentioned. Because they enriched in the population and patients with a lot more cramps, they actually had a very high number of cramps for 24 hours, seven over 24 hour period on the average. And they use a visual analog scale of zero to 100 in, or instead of zero to 10 in terms of assessing cramp severity. And that, and so their average intensity for these patients entering the study was 43. And so this is looking at every single patient in the study. And the gray is the placebo, the black is mixilatine. And you can see every patient save two has a, a reduction in the number of cramps by the end of the, their treatment period, some profoundly, like these patients profoundly. But there were two patients that paradoxically actually had worsening. But overall, cramps were reduced in 18 out of 20 patients with an average reduction of 1.8 cramps per day. That's what they looked at, cramps per day, with 5.3 cramps per day in the placebo group versus 3.5 cramps per day in the patients treated with mixolatine. And then in terms of cramp intensity, uh, again, there were some, uh, some patients who actually had paradoxically got worse, which I don't quite, under, quite understand. There were three patients who got worse, one patient who didn't benefit, but 16 out of 20 had substantial benefits, some profoundly, again, on an average 15 point drop on this scale, suggesting that this drug not only reduces cramp frequency, it, uh, it reduces the severity quite a bit. And again, they did not see any EKG or laboratory changes and they, they actually had, because it was a lower dose, is similar to what we found in the other the study I oversaw, it was very tolerable at 300 milligrams a day. There are no discontinuations of the drug. It was extremely effective for lowering cramp frequency and intensity of pain, even at low dose. And it helped the vast majority of patients. There were four patients, I didn't show this data, who eventually remitted entirely. And it works quickly, it, it, as, is, as I showed in the study I oversaw, it also worked within two weeks in this study, it been, it, 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 probably faster than that, because they didn't look at patients at week one. So I'm gonna end by talking about real world use of mixility. And this is from a, uh, this is a patient I saw recently in his response. Of course, not every patient's gonna respond, but this is my, how I strategized here. So. The 65-year-old ALS patient presented with debilitating muscle cramps in the legs for uh, the, at least two a day, or more than two a day, with an average pain intensity of five out of 10 on the visual analog scale I showed you from zero to 10. And they had had their symptoms from, for one year. Their ALS functional rating scale score was 39 out of 48 when they presented. Their vital capacity was just a little bit reduced to 75%, 80% is considered to be the cutoff for normal. And so I started the patient on mixilatine, 150 milligrams twice a day. 
and the cramps became less frequent and intense within two weeks, but were still quite bothersome to the patient. So then I increased to a dose that I not studied, but because we knew that, that there was a dose dependent effect on muscle cramps, I chose an intermediate dose, not 300, not 900, but rather 600 milligrams a day. And I was, so I gave the patient 300 milligrams twice a day. And at this point, um, he, he reports very few cramps, less than two a week, a low intensity, no more than two out of 10. And he has a little bit of nausea from time to time, but it's not much and it's pretty modest and he feels that the trade-off warrants the treatment. So I haven't answered these questions uh, from the study that I did. And I think overall, this, these question, the, the first question has not been completely answered, which is, is neuronal hyperexcitability a suitable therapeutic target in ALS, not just for cramps, but to slow disease progression? I, I don't think there's been a big enough study using any agent to really know that. There have been other studies have tried, that have looked at effects on in patients, but not very long studies. Uh, there's a drug called uh, isogabine, which um, my colleague Brian uh, Wanger at Massachusetts General Hospital studied, uh, but that drug has been taken off the market, so there's nothing we can, there's no way to use that drug. Uh, so the other question is, can a longer, larger study in mixiltine, which is a generic drug, show slowing of disease progression? Challenge there is there's no drug company who could subsidize such a big study, so that makes it very hard to do. So I want to acknowledge some people in particular who just gave me so much help when I did this study. Uh, Merit Sikovic, who is um, at the, the chair of neurology at the Massachusetts General Hospital and is a premier ALS clinical trialist. Bob Brown, who is currently at the University of Massachusetts, who shared his experiments with the SOD1 mice, the survival experiments. Bill David, who gave me some ideas about using the drug for muscle cramps. He's also at Massachusetts General Hospital. And this funding, the funding support for this was out of the Neurology Clinical Trials Unit, which is at the Massachusetts General Hospital, which coordinated the study in the Northeast ALS Consortium and ALS Therapy Alliance. And I am happy to take questions at this point. And you can also send them my way if you have follow-up questions once we're done. And that, that the email address uh, indicated. Thank you for that. We certainly did get a lot of questions. So I and Declan, our student ambassador, are going to yeah. alternate between the questions. And if you have any more, feel free to write them in the chat so we can add them to our list. But the first question comes from somebody who has been taking, um, it's pronounced mexilatine. Is Am I saying that correctly? Um, yes, mexilatine. So they've been taking mexilatine 150 milligrams three times a day for 10 yeah. years. They would like to know if this can affect their heart and what tests would you recommend in order to monitor any side effects from it? Well, that is a great, a great question. So usually, based on the studies, and uh, there's, there's, it's not clear that there's that the doses that we that we used in our study or the dose, the lower dose that was used in, in Dr. Os Oscarson's study, that the doses warrant continued EKG monitoring. What I usually do is. If a patient, I, do, I usually check a baseline EKG. If it's normal, I just check an EKG after, anytime I have a dose change or maybe a, a month after the initial dosing. And if it looks normal, I don't repeat the EKG because it's never been an issue. And I've had patients on mixiltine for years now. So if somebody had an, a cardiac issue that was not related to ALS, I depends on what it is. I, the, mo the concern is mostly about uh, prolongation of the PR interval and somebody with heart block, that's, that's the, you know, that would be the, the question. And I would probably just consult with their cardiologist before starting it. Uh, yeah, thank you for that response. Um, the next question is, what are some potential side effects of mixilatine? Uh, so uh, as is shown in, in, this, in uh, the study I oversaw, the main side effect is going to be nausea, but typically at higher doses, usually a dose is 900 milligrams, occasionally lower doses, like 600 milligrams a day. And it depends on the patient, how they, whether they have it or not. It's really hard to predict. It's the minority of patients. It's pretty uncommon. I have to stop it to, uh, because of nausea, I might have to back down on the dose just to kind of fine tune it to if, if they're having a lot of nausea, but usually that does the trick. Uh, some patients feel a little dizzy or, um, and they are a little lightheaded and occasionally have had a patient stop because of that. But again, that's dose dependent and I'll you try to back down on the dose and, and I'll, usually that does the trick for that. 
Other side effects are pretty far and few between. So I haven't really experienced a whole lot of anything else um, otherwise. Well, that's good news. Yeah. Uh, so this is probably the, the big question. Um, is mexilatine covered by insurance? And we have a patient in the chat who was prescribed mexilatine last July, yeah. but their insurance company wouldn't pay because the main purpose of the drug was not muscle cramps. How could mm. that be changed? Well, that's a great question. So mexilatine in Washington state is typically covered. And I haven't had, even with, um, you know, like state Medicaid, I haven't had any issues, so, but it clearly depends on the insurance company. It's a generic drug. So it's typically the insurance companies um, don't, don't have an issue with generic drugs, but clearly they do in the case of this, this poor uh, patient. And so I, you know, I, I'm not sure. I mean, sometimes if it can go to a peer to peer, I can make a compelling argument that it's useful based on the fact that there are two independent studies that have shown benefit in regard to muscle cramps and there really is anything else that shows benefit. But it's also not a super expensive drug. So I'm actually surprised when I hear that insurance companies turn it down, but that's usually what I do. I just see if I can do an appeal or a peer to peer. And I, I typically can convince the insurance companies. Otherwise, I'm not sure for any given insurance company how to make them more aware of the efficacy of the drug. They just often just don't know. It has to be brought to their attention by a physician to convince them um, to make their policy change entirely. That might be tough. Dr. Wise, before we go to the next question, can I have you stop sharing your screen so we can all oh. see a little bit more? Oh, sorry. That's okay. There's just been some requests to, to see you bigger. <laughs> oh, sorry. Thank you so much. I forgot much. that I, was, I hadn't stopped sharing my screen. It's okay. I totally forgot about that myself. <laughs> um, All right. So, yeah, that, that is actually is, uh, a good, sorry, oh, um, a good segue to the next question. Um, how can one get mixelatine? Does it need to be prescribed by a neurologist or can a GP prescribe it as well? I, it could be just prescribed by a GP. I don't know how comfortable GPs would be in prescribing it. Uh, most neurologists uh, who see ALS patients, or many neurologists, I don't know if it's most, but I would, I would think it's most at this point, know about mixilatine. Maybe some of, probably most of them are willing to prescribe. I'd be surprised if there's a neurologist that said, I'm not willing to prescribe mixilatine at all. So uh, neurologists would be the best bet, but I've had a few G, um, GPs, PCPs, agree to prescribe it. I just think that they're probably gonna end up just deferring to the neurologist to do it most of the time. So in terms of, I guess this is more of your, your research uh, wheelhouse, uh -huh. has any test been done on mexilatine on sporadic ALS patients? And if so, was it impactful for cramping? Well, the patients in the study were, were large were sporadic. I, I should have mentioned that and made that clear. They were sporadic ALS patients. We actually didn't look at patients with familial ALS. We could have, but it just, we wanted a more homogeneous population. I think, I'm pretty sure for Bjorn Osterson's study, they didn't, they just took all comers. And I don't remember how many patients in his study had familial ALS. It wasn't many, but I'm pretty sure that they had, they had familial, some of them had familial ALS. Yeah, and um, so for, for people who have difficulty swallowing, can mixolytine be administered um, intraven intravenously? Can't be administered intravenously. It comes as a capsule, um, but it could it come as granules, but because it's not uh, time-released, you can potentially open up the contents of the capsule and then push it through the feeding tube. I, I don't see why you can't do that. We didn't do it for the study because we we were concerned about unblinding because the if we try to get a capsule, the capsule we had made up to look like the drug is the placebo, we couldn't replicate the color of the granules enough. There's just no good way to do that. And we're just worried that patients are getting unblinded. So patients had to be able to swallow it for the study, but they can get it through the feeding tube. It's good to know. Um, or or you, could present, you could also put it in like applesauce, I guess, in, in your granules, probably put it in, if, even if somebody's able to eat but not swallow it, nor quite affect, they couldn't swallow a capsule, put it in applesauce maybe if they're able to swallow that way. Ways to get creative with it. Yeah. 
Um, you mentioned, I believe, mixilatine's effects on uh, SOD1 ALS patients. Were there any C9 ORF ALS patients in the study as well? I don't, well, not in, not in the study that I did. The study that Dr. Oscarson did, I think he had a couple of patients with SOD1 mutations. I don't believe they had C9 ORF. I don't have any reason to think, though, that it wouldn't work in patients with other with genetic forms of ALS because they have maybe the cause of their disease is different, but the but the end the end they also can get muscle cramps, and it's going to be for a similar reason. Um, I think if we were to do a study to determine whether it actually like a bigger study to determine whether it slowed the disease down, we'd have to decide whether to in include not only sporadic ALS, but different forms of genetic ALS, or would that make the population be too varied? But for muscle cramps, I can't see why you wouldn't want to use it for anybody with any genetic, with, even with genetic forms of the disease. I will say I've, I've used the drug, just so that you know, I've used the drug for other diseases that aren't even ALS. So patients with um, peripheral neuropathy sometimes get muscle cramps, and I use it for those patients. There's a benign disorder where patients get cramps, a lot of cramps, so they don't get ALS, cramps and fasciculations called cramp fasciculation syndrome. I've used it for that disease, and I think it can work for muscle cramps in all of those diseases, not for everybody, but it definitely can work. As long as the likely explanation for the cramps is there's a problem with the nerve to the muscle or the motor neuron, it has potential to work. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, so um, were, were any study participants in your study taking magnesium? Um, I think they probably, I think some of them were before they entered in the study, but that was, they had to come off of it to be in the study. They couldn't be on that too. We didn't want to have too many confounding medications, so they couldn't be on certain medicines like, um, if I recall, not, they couldn't be on baclofen, other muscle relaxants, magnesium, because it would interfere with the results. We wouldn't know. And, um, and so I believe they were excluded from, or they had to come off of it at least before the study. This next question is also in relation to your study, and if I did not convey it enough, let me know. Um, I believe there was a figure that showed a jump from 300 to 900. Can yeah. you maybe explain why such a jump and why there was nothing in between, or maybe there was something in between? Well, that's a good question. I, I, I think we wanted to see, so, the, so the, the dose, the maximum dose, if you look at, um, at um, like the physician desk reference, which has all the information about me medications and the, so the maximum tested dose for antiarrhythmias, or the, the, car, the maximum dose ever tested was 1200 milligrams. And, um, and we didn't wanna go up that high, but we wanted there to be a pretty big gap between low dose and high dose. So we could really test the limits for tolerability. Um, and, and I think we did. By doing that, if we'd gone to 1,200 milligrams, I suspect it would be a lot more than a third of the patients in that treatment arm to have dropped out, and then we wouldn't have gotten enough information to make to make uh, comparisons. So I'm I'm kind of glad that we did 900, but it was a little bit arbitrary, admittedly. We could have done 600. Yeah. Um, so a, a participant wants to know. They said you spoke quite a bit about hyperreflex. My startle reflex is on 10 the slightest unexpected movement, yeah. um, noise, and my body reacts like a gun went off. Would mixilatine help? Yeah, so what, what I, I guess I didn't make this uh, clear enough. So the hyperexcitability that I'm talking about is in a sort of a microscopic level uh, at the level of the mo of motor neurons. And I think what you're describing is more hyperreflexia. And so the reason for hyperreflexia is that the motor neurons in the brain tell the motor neurons in the spinal cord to relax. They inhibit them. And so they prevent the, the, the reflexes and from being jumpier. They prevent the muscle tone from being increased. They prevent sometimes what's called clonus, which is spontaneous spasticity or the legs jerk. And so um, when they degenerate, they can't do that anymore. And uh, there are other medicines that have potential to help that problem. Um, and those are muscle medicines that have been used to try to treat muscle cramps. 
And that would, but so like baclofen might help, but, could, but that's operating more at the level, um, not only at the level of the muscle, probably at the level of the spinal cord too. We know, that works in the central nervous system in a different way. Whereas we think McSiltine is working more at the level of the, of the, ner the motor neuron directly and um, getting that to quiet down. I don't think it, I would, I can't imagine it would help ever help with spasticity or hyperreflexia, and I've never seen it do that uh, for the reasons I mentioned. I know we want to be respectful of your time. We only have a couple of questions left. I just want to check in to make sure everything's okay on your end time-wise. It is. Perfect. As um, long as you, you don't mind me talking. <laughs> so. I, don't, I don't think we mind. <laughs> Can you speak, I think you mentioned you were going to, on uh, quinine sulfate or quinidine sulfate? Yeah, so quinine sulfate, uh, it, I, I think the status of, so at one point it was pulled off the market because of toxicity to bone, I want to say to bone marrow. It caused bone marrow suppression that was somewhat times somewhat fulminant. It could cause liver toxicity. It's a, it has a lot of potential toxicity. And then the FDA pulled it and then it's, they restored it with a black box warning, which means be very careful with this drug and not, don't use it for anything, it, uh, really don't use it for anything other than malaria, which is what it's used for. And, um, and so uh, I, given the fact that while some of us think that it can help with muscle cramps, that it has this high toxicity profile and it's never really been well studied in muscle cramps. I just don't use it anymore. I just feel very uncomfortable using quinine sulfate, especially when there is this other drug that's relatively well tolerated, at least at low doses, which is mixilatine. Um, and it works well. And we know it works well based on the two trials I mentioned, whereas we just don't have that information for quinine. I, I guess if somebody's on it and they're benefiting from it, they're tolerating it fine. I'm not going to say stop it, but I wouldn't introduce it again uh, in, a patient, in a new patient who needed help with muscle cramps. Uh, yeah, thank you for that response. Um, so this question is somewhat off topic, but do you have any thoughts about the efficacy and safety of uh, baclofen for muscle cramps? Um, I, I'm, I think there, I want to say there was a trial, a small trial done with baclofen for muscle cramps that wasn't as we didn't, it didn't end up being so efficacious, but at the very, and, and I'm trying to remember when that was done. But at the very least, there haven't been any definitive studies showing benefit in muscle cramps in ALS. Um, for spasticity, that's a different, different story. I, there is, I would definitely use it for spasticity. I guess if you had somebody who had spasticity and muscle cramps, you could see if it worked for both. But I don't think it works as well. I really don't. Um, maybe I'm, you know, just because I'm so used to giving mixiltine, I've gotten out of the habit of giving baclofen for muscle cramps. I just find that baclofen works better, and um, it's not no less well tolerated than mix than, or sorry, mixiltine works better, no less well tolerated than baclofen. Baclofen also causes other has other side effects. Mostly sedation can be pro problematic for baclofen. So. I would just use, I would just, I just would end up just using mixiltine for any patient with muscle cramps as initial therapy. And, 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 you know, I am biased. I did the study and I, but I know the results too pretty well. And I know I have a lot of familiar with the drug and it's at least where I would start. I guess if it didn't work, I might try something else like back with them. And we were going to make this last question. And the ones that we weren't able to get to with your permission, if it's all right, I'd love to email them to you to sure. have you take a look at them. Awesome. I'm happy, I'm happy to see them and I'll try to respond in the next couple of days. That's great. Um, we do have a very active community here if you if you weren't able to tell. So this is you our last question. Uh, do you have any new trials on the horizon? And if so, how can others get involved in those trials? Well, I'm, we're, we're participants in a lot of industry sponsored studies right now. And then also the Healy platform. So the Healy platform trial, and I don't know if any of you are involved in that, that is really the biggest uh, trial net, I don't know what you would call it, it's a multi-regimen trial um, that is a, a very expeditious way to test out new ideas about drugs in, in, a, in, a, uh, in um, a, a trial format that's been vetted by a lot of very 
uh, smart ALS clinical trialists like Mary Sikovich and her group at the Northeast ALS or uh, Mass General Hospital, the Northeast ALS Consortium, but also the FDA. The FDA was involved in the trial design. So um, I think that that is a very, uh, the best way to rapidly test out drugs. And, but you, there needs industry sponsorship, admittedly. But um, right now, that is sort of stealing the thunder about smaller trials. Um, in terms of other trials that I think are worth doing, so I, uh, when I started the McSultan trial, I, I was planning to do a study using a drug that promotes autophagy. And we talked about how that's impaired in ALS. And I haven't gotten up to the point where I've tried to get um, additional funding for it, but I'm it's probably going to. And that's a drug called rapamycin or serolimus. It's a drug that prevents organ transplant rejection. And there is some preclinical evidence that it has an impact on getting rid of those proteins that aggregate in the nerve cells of ALS patient motor neurons. So I think that'd be worth testing. But it would have to be a pretty small study because the funding mechanism for doing a large study is is it's 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 they're just it's too restrictive. You you have to partner with industry to make a big study happen, and that's what uh, the Healy platform has done. It's sort of philanthropy and industry, and with a lot of smart people deciding what drugs should be tested. Um, and I'm actively involved in that trial. I'm on the steering committee for Regimen F, and um, hopefully we'll be overseeing one of those regimens soon, the newer regimens, and probably that's going to take up a lot of my time soon. A big proponent of the Healy platform trial right now. Well, we are no strangers to the Healy trial yeah. platform. <laughs> um, with that being said, I want to thank you, Dr. Weiss, for joining us tonight. Mm -hmm. This next portion of our meeting is our non recorded open forum. You're welcome to stick around, but there's no pressure either way. Um, I'm going to turn this back over to McFinn, though. So, McFinn, it's all yours. Well, thank I, I wanted to say thank you. I'm going to have to, uh, to log up, but I wanted to thank everybody for coming to this. and. Um, and listening to me, hopefully I didn't drone on too long, <laughs> but I appreciate all the, all the really insightful questions and feel free to throw more my way through via my, uh, through, via my email. And I want to thank uh, everybody from Everything ALS for, for inviting me to give this talk.